Tonight, our lesson is the risk of people knowing who you are. Our text will be from chapter 2 of Esther, and we're going to read a good portion, well actually probably all of it, of Esther chapter 2, and use that as a jumping off point for some wonderful and very timely and very important lessons for us tonight. It was, uh, I want to share with you something. It was the first time I went to Carrie McGrew's classroom back many years ago. Many. Nine. And this was really before Carrie and I got to be good friends. We didn't really know each other. I don't remember why I was there. I imagine I was waiting for Chelsea, perhaps, and then kind of waited with Carrie in his classroom. Um, he was and is a coach. Uh, that's what everyone calls him, coach. But he also, at that time, was a government teacher. And he taught the United States government. He taught the Constitution, uh, taught the Founding Fathers. And, I, and, one, and one thing I loved when I walked into his classroom is that he had portraits of the Founding Fathers all over the room. He also had the words that most of them are inscribed in the Jefferson Memorial. If you've been to the Jefferson Memorial... You can't read that and not know that this country was founded on the biblical principles of God Almighty. And so when you, so uh, I, I'd love to see those words, inscripted words, all over the classroom. Saw the Bill of Rights, the, uh, the preamble of the Constitution, all those things. It's a government class. That's what you, what you learn. But the one thing that really caught my eye was sitting on his desk. And it was his Bible on his desk. And when I saw that, I knew I can be friends with this guy. It was impressive to me that he had his Bible on his desk. Now, there is a risk in things like that. Risk. This, these lessons are about risk. And I want to show you that we're not the only ones uh, that have risk in life. There have been people that really know risk that uh, our ancient brothers and sisters, our ancient um, uh, fellow uh, believers in God, they knew, they understood what risk was all about. There is risk in letting people know who you are. There is also risk in letting people know what you believe, know what you stand for, and when they... Know what you always do and what you will never do. There is a risk involved in every bit of that. Let me give you, let me give you some of the, the, the results or the price you can pay uh, for that risk. The risk, whenever you do that, the risk of being left out, the risk of being ostracized, the risk for being insulted by your peers is a very real thing. What else? There is also the risk of being watched for anything that you might say or do that is offensive or politically incorrect. That is the way of our life now. We have to know it. We have to admit that. There is also the risk of stumbling and failing and falling and sinning and then being labeled not human but labeled a hypocrite because you're not as perfect as you or you are claimed to uh, what you, uh, people say we claim to be. There is also the risk, as we saw last week uh, uh, with Vashti, the risk of being made an example of when you will not allow yourself to be dishonored um, or degraded in front of people. The risk of being made an example of what authority can do to believers in God and to believers in the Bible. That is a very real thing now. But here's the thing. You know that this risk is not new, right? This is not, we are not uh, the, the first people ever to have dealt with this. All right, uh, look at chapter 2 of Esther. Let's just read for a little bit. Because there are two verses, one, in, one is verse 10, one is uh, verse 20, and I want uh, you uh, and I to take a little trip to find out what those ideas mean for us today. 
Okay, the text says, Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had, had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what she had decreed or what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, Let a search be made for a beautiful, four beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint uh, com, uh, commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful girls into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of, of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let beauty treatments be given to them. It means get the hair did, right? Um, then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This advice appealed to the king. Man, no duh, right? <laughs> then, then he followed it. Boy, people haven't changed in centuries, or at least men, I guess. All right, enough of that. Verse 5. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer, uh, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Among those taken captive uh, with Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her mother and father died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther was also taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place of the harem. Now listen to this part, verse 10. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Why? Why would Mordecai, her father, her, uh, the one who loved her and took care of her, why would he order her, don't tell people who you are? What, is he not proud of who he is? Is he ashamed of being uh, a child of Abraham? Is he ashamed of being an Israelite, a Hebrew, a Hebrew, a Jew? Is he ashamed of it? Why would he say that? Down in verse 20, after this long process to, to pick who the, the new queen is going to be, this big uh, 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 countrywide beauty contest. And then uh, verse 19 says, When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's table. Now take, take note, that is a very important place to be, right? At the king's table. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when, she was, when he was bringing her up. Second time it's mentioned that she did not let people know who she was what her background was, what her religion was, what her, and for her, what her nationality was. Was she ashamed or was she wise? Was she wise considering the circumstances? Maybe she was scared. And maybe Mordecai was scared too. And I think that's probably typical in certain circumstances. You're seeing how this can already, if I said amen, you'd be happy and you can go home, but we're not going to do that, uh, that there's already a very good lesson there. That this is reality in so many ways. Are we ashamed of who we are? Are we ashamed of Jesus? Are we ashamed of the church or the Bible? Are we ashamed of simple New Testament, non-denominational Christianity, of being Bible only believers in God? Are we ashamed of things like this? Are we wise when we're silent? If we're silent. Are we wise when we hold our peace? 
Are we wise? Or is it normal if we are scared of certain things and certain events and certain situations that we might find ourselves in? Now what's interesting about this is that the book of Daniel, really, which is a companion writing to the, to the current situation that Esther finds herself in, the book of Daniel is the companion history that records the events of the Jewish deportation and also looking forward to the, to the return of God's people back to the land of Judah, back to, back to Israel. And what we learn in Daniel and also in Nehemiah and also in Ezra and, and all those uh, books in your Old Testament that are written about these events, one of the things that, shows that we are, are shown in there is that some of God's people were not only brave in those circumstances, they were open about who they were and they were willing to risk everything to be who they were. Risky. It was risky for Mordecai. And it was risky for Hadassah. And it was risky for the nation that was still, that hadn't gone back. They'd already had one deportation by this time. Uh, it, was, it was scary time for, for everybody. Now think about the people that were willing to take a risk. Take Daniel, for instance. Daniel was not going to be a man who could be told that he cannot pray to his God. And I'm going to open up my window, and I'm going to put my face toward Jerusalem like I've always done. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to change. And you can't make me. I also want to say, you're not the boss of me. But with that attitude, that's exactly what he was saying. And they threw him in a den of lions to be devoured as he was alive, to be devoured by beasts. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know, Meshach, Shadrach, right? They were not going to eat the pagan food that they were told to eat. They were not going to drink the wine. They were not going to worship pagan gods. And they were not going to be told that they had to. And they were thrown into fire. Hotter fire than they'd ever been able to stoke up. Seven times, right? Thrown into the fire. And because they were willing to take the risk, God rescued them from those situations. Now, God did not rescue everybody since then, has He? A lot of people have died for God. A lot of people have stood firm and died because of who they were as people of God. That's another reality. And it's going on now of the people in this world who name Christ and are dying for and taking the risk and standing up. Um, and even those who don't stand up and who might escape, try to escape, they are paying the price too. So my point is, how then do we view Esther? How do we view her? I'm not going to tell him who I am. Mordecai told me not to tell me. And since, basically, since I was a little girl, you said, don't let people know who you are. Is that right? Is it wrong? Does it glorify God? Is it something that they should be ashamed of? How then do we view Esther? When I look at Esther, what I know about her, I only know as much as you'll know by reading the text. I don't think we should ever judge her for listening and obeying what Mordecai told her to do. Don't judge her uh, for, for keeping her secret about, about being a child of Israel. God, through Mordecai, was trying to protect this woman. Since we know how the story goes, most of us, if you don't, you'll, you'll get it. God's doing something here. And God is protecting this woman uh, and, her, and her father, Mordecai. He also knew Mordecai. Mordecai also knew since he was at the king's table and he was an important person, uh, a, a, a person who knew certain things. I think it's very clear that Mordecai also knew that there was some political intrigue brewing against the king. 
And in that court, a plot was afoot in the kingdom. Look at verse 21 through 23. During this time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Uh, uh, I, always, I always heard big fauna, but I know that's not the way to do it, but I like that big fauna. <laughs> Sounds like, a, yeah. And Teresh, uh, two of the king's officers were guarding the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. All this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. Went into the history books. There's stuff going on. Mordecai knows there's stuff going on. Mordecai knows this isn't all that's going to be going on as well, folks. As, we, as the story unfolds, more and more of this stuff that is going to threaten God's people, threaten... Uh, you know, even if it can happen that way, threaten God's plan of what God is trying to do through His people that will bless us uh, to this day. And so we don't judge Esther for keeping certain things to, her help, uh, to herself. Now, my question for you and I to consider, though, is what about us? Is it right for us to keep our faith and who we are and what we believe to ourselves? Are there times when that's wise and necessary? Or is it always to be said, always to be talked about, always to be, bam, bigger than life, in your face, this is who I am? How wise is that? How smart is that? I'm wondering now. Can I wonder out loud? I'm wondering out loud. Let's see what the Word of God says, and then we won't have to wonder anymore. All right. One of the scariest things that we can be asked is not, are you a Christian? That's not a scary thing to be asked. Now, folks, we live in Texas. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting a Christian in Texas. They're everywhere, all right? Or a believer, at least, at the minimum. Christians are everywhere. So it's not, you have to summon all my strength and say, I'm a Christian. They'll probably figure that out by and by if you live the life, right? Okay? Bible on your desk. Your language is clean. Um, you know, the, 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 the holy, blameless life like we talked about this morning. Uh, people can figure things like that out. So it's not. Don't think that you're being like this big, virtuous, um, just uh, strong person saying, I am a Christian. There's a lot of those around. But here's the deal. The challenge is answering truthfully, faithfully, and confidently when we are asked certain questions about who we are, what we believe, what we stand for, what we will never do, and what we will always do. Now there's where, whoo, okay, now we're going to be careful. All right? Let me give you some. Okay, this, I, I made this list simply by what I read, what I see, what I hear, as the, the litmus test almost uh, that, that people can go through. Do, do Christians and Muslims follow the same God? Abraham's in both books. Jesus is in both books. So Allah is our God. Allah is the God of Abraham, Isaac. And Jacob. Hear that. Have you heard it? It's there. Read it. Hear it. Christians struggle with this. I'm telling you. They, they struggle with this. Younger Christians especially. How about this? Is Jesus the only way to be saved? Is Jesus the only way to be saved? You're making yourself as an elitist and, and, and exclusionary. Do you believe the universe is billions and billions and billions of years old? Answer that the wrong way. You're a troglodyte. I don't even know what that word is, but I know I used it right. <laughs> Did God really create the world in six days? Six 24-hour periods? Or was it six eons of time? 
How about this? Are you for or against homosexual marriage? Answer me. For or against? It's no black and white. I, I wasn't talking to you. That was rhetorical. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Are you for or against homosexual marriage? How about this? These are questions people are having to answer. Is practicing homosexuality a sin? Is it immoral? Is it, here's the one that can get you in trouble. Is it abnormal? Okay. Do you believe that abortion is wrong? Do you believe it is murder of innocent, unborn human life? You see? You see those questions? You can say you're a Christian all the live long day. No one's going to care. Whatever. We got a lot of those around here. But these are, it's the questions that we have to be ready for. They're blind, you can be blindsided by them. And you're for, uh, 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 and we just, we flub it up. I've seen Christians, I've read them, and I've heard them say the, can I say dumb? The dumbest things. Because the pressure was on, the heat was on, and they blew it. And they would say ugly, mean, ungracious, unmerciful, unchristlike things even about sinful things that we know are sinful. You see how the challenge is that? That's the risk. It's the risk of what people think about us and what people can do to us, whether they have the authority or have the power or not. These are the things that happen because the answers that you give can determine your status. And in this society right now, status is everything. From your work status to home status to family status to Facebook status. That is everything. The answers you determine will determine how people view you and your life at work, at home, at school, and online by the answers you give. So I'm going to say right here, lesson number one, we need to give good, gracious, thorough Biblical answers spoken in love and with understanding. That's how we start to get through the challenges like this. So, the best way to determine the risk of letting people know who you are, what you believe, what you stand for, what you will always do, and what you will never do, the, the best way to do this is to judge how we do that by the Word of God. I want to share with you just some of the Word um, of God that will help us see how we need to be. Some of these you know, some of these may be new to you, maybe new to you in this type of context, perhaps. I want to give you a compelling contrast in confidence. A compelling contrast contract, or contrast rather, uh, in confidence. Matthew 26, Kevin read a portion of it to us a minute ago. Matthew chapter 26, we'll start, now we're going to go back further than Kevin started. We're going to go to verse 57. 26 verse 57. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Now, what does that mean? They can't get you for who you are. They can't, they can't uh, convict you. What do they do? Let's make stuff up. Or take what you said and completely twist it, take it out of its meaning of what you meant. And they know that that would be true. You know, remember building up the temple three days, that business, right? Um, finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build, rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained what? Silent. There is a time to keep your mouth closed. 
That doesn't make you bad. That doesn't make you ashamed. It makes you wise. There's a time to be quiet, to be silent, especially if you're being accused. All right? Now, it says, it goes on in 63, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Now Jesus, as a Jew, knows that now he has to. He has been charged with an oath. He, by law, he must answer. He can't be silent. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. And he didn't stop there. Now he's really going to say it. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming in the cloud or coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? But meanwhile, meanwhile, where's Peter? He's there. He's sitting. Jesus was able to keep his mouth closed when he needed to, and then he was able to stand up and say what he knew he had to say, and he said it, and he said more. He said more than they asked for, and then Peter. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The tale of two men right there. One kept his peace because it was the wise thing to do. And then when it was the right thing to do, he opened his mouth and with, with passion, he said exactly who he was and what they needed to hear. But Peter, in the same situation, with the same fear and the same type of people everywhere around him, he failed. He failed. I hope you love him. You know why we should love Peter? Peter is every one of us. That's Peter. That is us. Now, the compelling contrast. Um, I don't have time for this, but you know what's interesting? Go through the book of John uh, uh, sometime. And just as you read the book of John, you'll look and you'll notice how many passages say that the people were afraid to proclaim Jesus, to talk about Jesus, or to admit that Jesus was the Son of God or the Messiah. They were afraid to do so because they'd either be put out of the, the synagogue or they could be arrested, they could be persecuted. And so the people, they did believe, but they kept their mouths shut. What, did they not have faith? I think they were being very wise. Now, does that mean that you can always be that way? Of course not. Of course not. Because Jesus talked about those certain things. Listen to what Jesus said with that reality in mind. What we go through, what they went through, Jesus had a lot to say about these things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be wise and be innocent. And know the difference between the two. You have to know when to answer and how to answer. You must know that. You also have to be innocent uh, in that your life can't damage that whatever voice you have or reputation you have. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, but now with that in mind, where Jesus knows He's sending us to the wolves, right? 
Jesus said, Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus said people are going to have to notice for God to get the praise. You know what's interesting about that? You don't have to say a word to do that. You don't have to say a word. Serve Jesus. Love people. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind all the way. And you will be a shining light in this era, right? Matthew 7, verse 6. Now Jesus said this. Same sermon, by the way. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. Kind of cryptic. We have something special as disciples. And I'm not just going to throw it out there just for silly reasons or to satisfy the whims of anybody who doesn't believe it in the first place. I'm not going to do it. How about this? Then Jesus said uh, in Mark 8, 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. In spite of the risk, when it comes down to it, right, we cannot be ashamed of who we are, what we believe, what we stand for, whose we are, what we will never do, and what we will always do. Without shame, we need to proclaim. Right? I like that. Without shame, we need to proclaim. Write that down. Um, do you see how vital it is and how hard it is, but how real it is? So I'm going to give you now my advice. This is from me, my advice to you. Be very careful and wise in your conversations. Choose wisely who you have these conversations with because not everybody genuinely wants to know. A lot of people genuinely, some people generally just want to know what you're thinking on those matters for their own ends. Be wise, be careful, and be innocent in those conversations. And when you do speak, speak confidently, obviously, but speak the truth. And how do you do it? Ephesians 4.15, in love. Love. I think it presupposes gentleness, don't you? I think it presupposes politeness in that as well. Number three, don't argue. Don't argue. I don't care if they're in the body of Christ or outside the body of Christ. I don't care if they're in the world or they're the most righteous people you know. Don't argue. Listen, you are not obligated in any way, biblically speaking, to argue with an arguer. Don't get sucked in. Don't do it. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere good. So when we stand we stand with the love of Christ and with the Word of God, not as arguers. But here's the thing. We are obligated, though. What is our obligation? Meaning, we have to. An obligation is something that God says, this is you, this is your life, this is what you must do, this is who you must be, you must be about this. Romans chapter 1, verses 14 through 16 teaches us that we are obligated to the wise, we are obligated to the fools to share the good news message about Jesus Christ with them. We are obligated. That is our work. That is what we must share. That is what we never can keep to ourselves. That is what we can never be ashamed. We can never be ashamed of the gospel. So stay with the gospel then. There's where your conversations go. I'm not going to have discussions over abortion with someone who simply wants to use something, what I say, to hammer me later. I'm not going to play it. They can just put two and two together to know I don't agree with that. All right? So, use the gospel. That's what we use. Concentrate on that. Do you remember what Paul said? I am determined to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. How in the world are we going to do better than that? Right? All right. Now we have a lot to digest. Let's stand up. It's easier to digest when you stand up. 
Let's sing this next song. If we can help you in any way, uh, please let me know what that need is, and we'll take care of it tonight. Let's...